As wildlife photographers, Mick and I, like many others, have bucket lists. One of the top ones is obviously the Great Migration. This shot focused our attention on the migration becoming our next trip. As we passed through the villages, there were some very colourful stalls on either side of the road. The owners bartering their wares all through the villages. There was also an extremely insecure looking building that turned out to be a bank. You'd never believe it. The shirt says, we care you for quality services. A little ironic. Grammar may be excused, but as for filling plastic bottles with petrol, not exactly high quality standard. We encountered many Maasai, the men herding the cattle, the boys herding the goats, and the women herding both goats and donkeys. Overnight, the cattle are stored safely in a corral made of cactus plants to keep all predators at bay. As in many countries, Tanzanian women balance heavy loads on their heads. This skill is perfectly demonstrated here. This shows how happy and friendly all the children we met are. Here is a version of Tanzanian humour. It certainly made us laugh. Arusha's version of KFC. Karuta Fried Chicken. Under the telephone numbers on the sign, it says, even the chickens recommend us. Absolutely brilliant. During the planning of this safari, Katikati Kati Safaris were so accommodating and keen to tailor our trip exactly to our needs. As soon as we got off the plane at Kilimanjaro, there was the driver holding up the Katikati Kati sign and from that moment on, everything was taken care of. I'd developed a connection with Seb, the owner, in the months prior to our trip. So much so, the evening of our arrival, we were invited to dinner with his family. When we arrived, Mick and I were honoured to find out that we were the first clients to have met Seb's family, let alone be invited to a sumptuous dinner that his mother, Ruspina, had prepared for us. It was all lo local Tanzanian cooking, beautifully prepared, and the main ingredient of the evening was Eland meat, something we were very honoured to have received. It was an absolutely superb meal, beautifully presented. This was another first for Mick and I. Apparently they're in France and other countries as well, but we'd never experienced such a toilet. The hose came in very useful at times, as toilet roll wasn't always readily available. It does make you wonder how somebody with extremely bad knees manages to get up and down from these awkward positions. October is not the best time of year for birds in Tanzania, unfortunately. You've got the ever-present vultures, the flamingos and the roller, plus one or two other little bonuses that we came across. But um, unfortunately, as I say, not the best time of year if you want to go bird watching. Another of the few birds that we did see, this one, a black winged stilt. These basic little villages were scattered all over the place. Very rudimentary and Lord knows how they kept the rain out. This slide is a perfect example of a Maasai village. The central corral is made of old cactus stalks and trees to keep the cattle in and the predators out. This is where they're corralled overnight 
and during the day, as I've said before, all the livestock are taken out to graze all around the area. Actually, a beautiful place with a beautiful view. Not too bad a home, I don't think. sunny in Tanzania. sign speaks for itself, the entrance to the famous Ngoro Goro crater, a once in a lifetime visit for so many people. lodge and unfortunately some poor soul's gone over the side in a truck and apparently he's laid out just up the road they've dragged him out don't know what's wrong but uh, pretty tragic pretty tragic and as you can see fairly recently happened so a bit of a sad thing to come across really Once on the crater floor, we came across the iconic baobab tree. Absolutely enormous. The scale is obvious with the zebra around it. Funnily enough, the material it's made from is more fibrous than wood. So much so that you can drive spikes of wood into its side and climb the tree with handholds and footholds. There are many giraffe in the crater, and here we were fortunate enough to witness a show of dominance between two young males, necking. The loser walks away, only to return and carry out mutual grooming. Rarely are there any injuries through this activity. We witnessed a few zebra wildebeest and elephant. To be perfectly honest, there was not the concentration of animals in the crater that we expected or came across. However, that may have been just one of those days. As we all know, nature and wildlife is a little bit of a lottery.
As we came out of the crater, we passed through forest, which contained frolicking monkeys, both adults and young. As you exit the crater, you must stop at the viewpoint. It is absolutely stunning. As you can see, the fantastic backdrop is a perfect opportunity for a selfie. The outside two are Mick and I, the man in the middle, Sebastian Alley, the owner of Catty Catty Safaris. He's the one that made this happen for us. We had a couple more opportunities to stop on the roadside and take a couple of snaps of the wonderful sight of the crater. Different viewpoints make different photographs. This is the Old Duvai Gorge. It is one of the most famous archaeological sites in the world, revealing human, biological and technical evolution over the past two million years. Paranthropus boisei left the Nutcracker Man. On the right, Homo habilis, handyman. He's the one that used pebble tools. Absolutely amazing sight and a privilege to witness. As you drive through the Serengeti National Park, you will see several of these blue blankets. The idea of the blue is to attract the flying, biting insects and the cloth itself is treated with a solution that will kill these bugs, hence making it a more comfortable place to visit. This is the male and female version of the Agama lizard, which is otherwise known as the Spider-Man lizard, and you can see exactly why it's called that. Here, just a single shot of the dwarf mongoose. We all know about the Maasai warriors and their reputation. This is an example of the Maasai's softer side. The women are hard-working and gifted. They're the ones that produce such beautifully coloured necklaces and earrings. The older generation are respected and cared for, just as the very young are constantly in the care of their working mothers. The queen of this group of lionesses spots the warthog from a distance, and then the stalking begins. It was not going to be a quick capture. She was going to need all her speed and guile to make the kill. Once she'd secured the warthog, all of her sisters moved in for the feast. At first, the feast was amicable, until eventually the huntress decided she was not prepared to share any more. This is the point where she decided to take the rest of the spoils, being followed by one or two of the sisters, but they eventually gave up and went back to what was left. It isn't very long until the cleaners start to move in. The hyena with their powerful jaws, the vultures who just pick at everything, and then the jackals clearing up the final bits and pieces. And nothing is left to waste, absolutely nothing. This is the Hazabi tribe, the only hunter-gatherers left in northeast Africa. Experts with bow and arrow. Unfortunately, I don't think Mick is going to have the skills to survive on his own. This tribe treats dogs as tools.
they are not shown affection, but they are treated very, very well, very well looked after. And Hadzabi, Hunter and Seb in front of the hide of a small antelope called a dick dick. The next clip illustrates how they peg out the hide to dry while the ants clean the flesh off. Once the meat had been stripped, nothing was wasted. The bones, including the skull, were simmered to create a broth. Mick and I accepted Franco, the chief's offer, to try it. Actually, it was nice. The boiled bones went to the dogs. Affection for the children from both sets of parents is obvious. The children play and are very, very happy. No, um, somebody thought I was, I sounded like David Attenborough. Oh, it's corn that they've got on the end of there. I wonder what it was that was on the end of the arrows. Yeah. <laughs> Hey, hey.
the whole tribe are happy, despite their obvious lack of what we would consider essentials. Clearly, dental hygiene is non-existent, but pride is in abundance. Craftsmen who know how to enjoy themselves, happy to share everything they have. For the first time in my life, I tried a small drag on their pipe. I tried, for the first time in my life, a small drag on their pipe, out of respect and curiosity, thinking it was tobacco, when in fact it was something very much stronger. Then came the singing. No, no, no. <laughs> oh, that's enough for me. <coughs> oh, I said to you. This is incredible. <laughs> It was an absolute privilege to photograph these hunters just as the sun was going down. Absolutely marvellous silhouettes. It was time to go. Franco, the chief, and I shared a photo. We could not understand a word each of us said, but we still had fun. The Serengeti is not only about the struggle for survival. Witnessing companionship and fun moments were also part of the experience. The shot we were both looking for was of a warthog family running with their tails up. I think we succeeded. The Totoga tribe are metal workers, again very friendly people, 
Nowadays, they use old nails to create arrowheads. Also, they work scrap brass, aluminium and copper to make bracelets. There are different arrowheads for each type of game, from small ball wood arrows with corn cob on the tip for killing birds without much damage, right up to poison arrows, which will take down eland and buffalo. The women and children grind maize into flour. Lions certainly know how to relax, but this was a first for us. We've all seen domestic cats roll onto their backs, but I get the feeling nobody's going to rub this lot's bellies. This group occupy an outcrop of rock known as copies, taking advantage of their position to relax in the sun whilst scanning the area for prey. Man can certainly affect the behaviour of wildlife, but when there's only one thing on his mind, nothing or no one gets in his way. Oh, they're pretty cute. Just need to turn around. Yeah, here we go, all three. We never did the balloon trip, as we had so much to fit in, we had to prioritise. And, as wildlife photographers, didn't feel aerial shots would be worth sacrificing a day, or even half a day for. That was a mistake. The balloon drifted low over the area, giving a very different viewpoint just overhead, not way up high. Every day, as in most safaris, we had picnics. Ours were always in superb locations with gorgeous views, most having a toilet facilities. This is a small selection. Some of the time, we had to stay in the vehicle. We definitely didn't argue with that, for obvious reasons. The sheer scale and beauty of this place makes you feel very inferior. The safari vehicle was specially modified for photography. Maximum three people. The roof pops up for 360 degree access. The windows are removed and outrigger shelves are fitted. Plus, it's a Toyota Land Cruiser, even having tread on the side walls of the tyres, giving grip all around essential when negotiating certain terrain. Mick has a larger than average head and struggles to find hats to fit it. Seb, the owner of Catty Catty Safaris on the other hand, doesn't have that issue. Once witnessed, never forgotten, this spectacle is not just for photographers. I defy anyone to not be in awe of this once-in-a-lifetime experience. In the song, it says, at the end of the road, there's a golden sky and the sweet silver song of the lark. Swap out sweet silver song of the lark for sweet, lush and green plains of grass. Then, try to imagine yourself as one of these beautiful animals. Alone, this journey we all know is impossible. However, with hope, faith and unity, anything is possible. This song might just capture some of that sentiment. When you walk through a storm Hold your head up high And don't be afraid of the dark At the end of a stone There's a golden sky 
the sweet silver song of love. Walk on to the end. Walk on to the end. Just thought of taking the camera out, the phone out, and videoing it. Yeah, yeah. It's what most, doing. most of it is already gone. It's loads. This is just the stragglers. Yeah, I know. But oh, compared sorry. to the first lot that went over. Oh yeah, I get you. What an experience. Six crossings in five days. Almost unheard of. Fantastic October safari with Catty Catty Safaris. No crossing. Oof. That stinks, doesn't it? No, that's not me. That's the mud, I think, Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> an example of the wonderful lodges that we stayed in, all with absolutely stunning views.
As you can see, the hours of darkness were just as interesting as the daylight hours. Constant reminders dotted around the landscape, just to let you know this is a hostile environment. He, yeah. Well, she'll have to creep up. He'll have to creep up closer because he's going to run from here, is he? Just a final word about this wonderful place. If any nature lovers or wildlife lovers amongst you get a chance, you have to visit Tanzania. This passage is from the book Innocent Hunters, after the authors witnessed a pack of hyenas pulling down a buffalo. We still hate to watch it, and yet, though it seems longer at the time, the victim is usually dead within a couple of minutes and undoubtedly in such a severe state of shock it cannot feel much pain. Indeed, lions, leopards and cheetah, which have the reputation of being clean killers, often take ten minutes or more to suffocate their victims. And who are we to judge which is the most painful way to die? And so, we do not join the ranks of those who condemn hyenas and wild dogs as vicious brutes that should be ruthlessly exterminated, for they kill in order to eat, to live in the only way for which evolution has fitted them. It is in fact only man who kills with complete awareness of the suffering he may inflict. Only man therefore can be guilty of deliberate torture. The history of mankind, if one pauses to think back over the years, is lurid with the so-called inhumane acts of humans, and indeed the infliction of torture seems to be part of man's heritage. Torture of men and animals alike, and man, it seems, has always been fascinated in some way by suffering and death. Finally, one thing we would change based on our experience. Try to target realistic goals only, instead of trying to cover everything in the region. We rarely spent more than one night in each lodge. These could be four to six hours away along those terrible roads. By the time we'd completed our 12-day safari, we were both physically and mentally drained. 